One of the reasons why we are scared to be used by God is because we feel that we are inefficient, we are insufficient, and because we are not worthy. If people just knew how unworthy we were, you know, God's going to pick somebody who hasn't lost their temper. God's going to pick somebody who is a nicer person. But I want you to know that God knew what He was doing when He chose you. Amen? Amen. So I want to play you a movie clip that I think captures everything that we feel when we feel God calling us to step out, to try something, to speak to somebody. We're scared that we might fail, and I think that this movie clip is going to help you. It's going to encourage you the next time you have an opportunity. Are you ready? All right. Thank you. Hit it, Megs. Hey. Denise. Hey. Looks exciting. Is there anything I can do to help? Oh, no. That's cool. I think my crew's got it pretty much covered. So. Good luck. Don't worry, Denise. I've done this before. Totem Spirit Fox. Whether you realize it or, you, or not, in your mind, that's the picture that you have when God is calling you to do something. Am I right? Yeah. It's like you see yourself failing before it's even happening. You see yourself falling short. You see the person responding a different way. And I want you to know that tonight that image is going to change. You're going to start to see yourself as an overcomer. You're going to start to see yourself as victorious because of what Jesus Christ has done. Tonight, I hope you brought your brokenness because God is about to do something very special in our lives and in our hearts. You see, I think the greatest hypocrisy is that we come together and we pretend that everything is okay and everything's all good when many times it's not. When nowhere in Scripture does it say that we are supposed to be like that, that we are supposed to put on a mask and pretend like we are not carrying the burdens that we are carrying. No, it says, cast your cares onto Him, for He cares for you. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. And let's get started. Let's start in chapter 12, verse 9. When Jesus came, he changed the culture. You see, before Jesus, if a leper touched you, you became unclean. But once Jesus came, when he touched the leper, the leper became clean. You see, Jesus changed the culture. Before he came, there was only a select few who could come into the most holy, intimate place of God's presence. But after Jesus came, it became a whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Amen? It became a whosoever. It became anybody who cried out to Him would be saved. Anybody who wanted to be used by Him would be used. He changed the culture, and we want to change the culture. Right from the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, it caused them to want to run away from God. Am I right? It caused them to want to hide from God. It caused them to want to cover up their nakedness and their shame and get as far away from God as they could. But you see, when Jesus came, that all changed. So many of us feel unworthy. We can't f share the gospel. We don't know enough. We're not good enough. 
But can I take you and talk you through God's recruitment process? Do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear the men and women that God chose to transform this world? Moses studded. David's armor didn't fit. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Timothy had ulcers. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Talk about a hindrance to ministry right there, right? <laughs> Amos's only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Jacob was a liar. So was Abraham and Isaac. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus was from the wrong town. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. <laughs> John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. So was Moses. So was David. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. John the Baptist was a weirdo. <laughs> Martha was a workaholic. Mary just liked to sit. <laughs> Samson was a long-haired womanizer. And Noah got naked drunk. Do you know what naked drunk is? When you get so drunk that your clothes fall off you. You see, the question that I want you to ask yourself tonight is not what can you do, but what can God do through you? Jesus is not scared of your sin. He is not overwhelmed by your mistakes. He is not embarrassed of your shame, and he is not limited by your limitations. Can I read that again? Jesus is not scared of your sin. He's not overwhelmed by your mistakes. He's not embarrassed of your shame. And he's not limited by your limitations. You see, the blind man cried out to Jesus when he heard that Jesus was coming by him. Why? Because he realized he had an ailment. He, he knew he had a problem. He, he knew he had an issue. And he knew that the solution, the problem solver, the healer, the great physician was walking by him. And so many times with our physical sickness, we have no problem coming for prayer, for Jesus to heal, to touch. But then why do we not treat every area in our life the same way? He came to conquer sin. No matter what form that sin is in, he's saying, come. He's saying, bring me your brokenness, bring me your shame, bring me your nakedness, bring me your pain. He's not running from it when other people go, eh. He's saying, come. When other people say too much, he's saying, come. You see, because it is in our brokenness that we discover the power of Jesus Christ. As he said, it's not the well that need a physician, but the, but the sick. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, it says this. Paul is talking to the Lord about his issues. And he says, each time he said to me, my grace is all you need. My grace is all you need. I feel like this would maybe be one of the best sermons I ever preached if I could just stand here and say, my grace is all you need. Because once somebody realized what this was saying and realized that his grace is all that you need, some lives would start to transform. Once we realize that his grace is all that we need, it would stop being Jesus plus something to Jesus plus nothing because Jesus is enough for us. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Let me ask you, are there any weak people here tonight? Are there any people who just, you, you, you can't do it all by yourself? Are there any people that sometimes you're feeling overwhelmed, sometimes you're feeling overcome, sometimes you're feeling depressed, sometimes you're feeling low on energy, low on strength? Well, I want you to know that it is in those moments that you can see the greatest move of God that you've ever seen. When you are one step away from giving up, is when you can experience the most power that you've ever felt to cause you to run again. 
that to not withdraw from God and step back and hide away when we are feeling overcome and overwhelmed, but it's the time that we press in and we go to Him and say, your grace is all that I need. Did you hear that list, that resume that I read to you of these men and women of God? If that left anyone here still feeling like you out, outside the fence, man, what could you have possibly have done that was worse than that? I want you to know there's nothing that you have done. Because if your sin is greater than the blood of Jesus, then what Jesus did on the cross was not that great. If what has happened to you and what you have done is greater than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then you are saying that that sin is more powerful than the Son of God who conquered sin. It's not the case. What he did on that cross was perfect, it was powerful, and it was complete to enable you to live out a victorious life here for him on this earth. And the devil is constantly trying to renew your mind to tell you you're not enough, you're not so good. You're a bad person. I know what you did last summer, right? He's trying to, all the time, bring things to our, our remembrance, bring things to our mind. But not tonight. Because tonight we say, okay, you want to bring that memory? Okay, bam, I put it under the blood of Jesus. Now what are you going to do? Right. Amen? Amen? If your past is bothering you, I want you to know it's no longer your past if you've given it to Jesus. He purchased it with his blood, and you are trespassing in a place that does not belong to you anymore. Amen? Amen? And as I heard one preacher say, when the devil tries to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. My grace is all that you need. Do me a favor, turn to the person next to you and say, His grace is all you need. Now turn to the person on the other side and say, His grace is all that you need. It is only by the grace of God that I stand here today. There have been so many times where I have, if I could have disqualified myself, and crossed my own name off the list, I would have done it. Has anyone else ever felt like that? Where you've done something that it just feels like it was so bad, it's such a dead end, you've burnt every bridge, you've blown up everything, and it's like there is no hope, there's nowhere to go. Who would ever want a person like you? Has anyone ever felt like that? And then precious Holy Spirit starts to come, and He calls your cell phone, and He tells you a nice message. <laughs> Turn with me to Jude chapter 1, verse 24. <clears throat> Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Listen to this. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you with great joy into His glorious presence without a single fault. Who on earth can that be talking about? That can't be me. And that definitely can't be you, right? Let me read it again. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into His glorious presence without a single fault. Is this what it says or am I reading from a different book here? Does that say that in your Bible too? He will keep you from falling away and bring you into his glorious presence without a single fault. So many of us are so judgmental on ourselves about the things that we have done. And we are not giving enough credit to what Jesus Christ has done and is doing in our life. It is His work, and we're so trying to hold on to Jesus, but I want you to know that He is holding on to you. He is holding on to you, and it is Him that when you call to Him, that will keep you from falling away. When you have said, Lord, I want you to rescue me and save me, do you know that He doesn't let go? Could you imagine the, the Coast Guard rescue someone, and they're like, oh, we're tired now, boom, just drop you. <laughs> right? 
No, no, no. When they get you, they hold you until they've got you safely. And that's what he's saying. Until I've got you safely into his glorious presence, I'm going to keep you from falling away. Is that good news for anybody beside me? Because when I look at my life, let me tell you what, I count more than a single fault. Anyone? But I want you to know the way God is looking at you and the way God sees you, He's not looking at you just by yourself. He's looking at you through the lens of the blood of Jesus and you look remarkable to Him. When He calls you, He's not calling you by your own limited ability. He's calling you with His ability. And so there's nothing that you cannot accomplish in Him and through Him. So when He calls us for tasks that seem overwhelming, they're already done in Jesus Christ because he's looking at you through his own power and through his own blood. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time, in the present, and beyond all time. Good night. That's what he said. Amen. Done. That's what he left them with. This is true or it's not. And if it's true, Lord, I'm going to run with this. I'm going to take this. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to, I'm going to live with a greater expectation. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go a little further because if you said this, if you're holding on to me, Lord, well, let, let, let's, let's go. Let's, let's see. Let's do. Lord, if you are looking at me with this type of love and this type of compassion and this type of excitement, Lord, Let's do this. Let's see this. Amen? Amen. God is not looking for your ability. He is looking for availability. Many of you might feel like you are not able, but how many of you are available? Right? If you would just show up, He would equip you. If you would just show up, He will enable you. If you will just show up, he will use you. And so many times we're like, but I, I don't know how to do it. And God's saying, I'm not asking you how to do it. I'll, I'll take care of the how to. I just need you to do do, right? <laughs> I was reading this book to my little girl. I think it was called The Blub Blub Fish. Couldn't wait to read this book. Real page turner. Is that right? The Blub Blub Fish? What was it? Something like that. Anyway, we start to read this, and this fish goes to school for the first time, and it goes into, into math class, and this fish can't do any math, and it's just so depressed, this fish, and like, I can't do anything, I'm useless, I'm stupid, all of that. Then it goes to science class, same thing. And eventually, this fish has completely depressed itself, and it's leaving school. And the teacher catches the fish, and it's like, it's your first day of school. You don't have to know how to do math or science, or anything. You just show up, and I'm going to teach you. And I feel like we have done that so many times. I don't know how to raise the dead, so I can't talk to my neighbor. <laughs> right? I don't know how to prophesy yet, so I can't take cookies over and say, Jesus loves you. And it's in the going, it's in the doing that he's teaching and training. When he called Peter and said, I'm going to make you fishes of men. Peter didn't say, okay, let me see your manual. Let, let me see the steps. Let, let me see. He just followed Jesus. And in the following, he was transformed. And in the following, he was changed. And in the following, he grew. And right when Peter thought that he was now the bee's knees and he had it all down, was when he denied Christ. And that still did not disqualify him from being used by God. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Amen. So many things we think disqualify us, and they don't. Matthew 22 verse 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. As we spoke about last week. Many are called, but few are chosen. Who are the ones that are chosen? The ones that accept the call. The ones that accept the call are the ones that are chosen. The ones that show up are the ones that are chosen. Everybody is called, but the ones that say, I'll go, are the ones that are chosen. It's like this. You know, who will, who will go get pizza tonight? I'll go. You're chosen. Right? 
Who'll go, who will go mow the grass? I will. You have been chosen. Do you want to be chosen tonight? Because this isn't a matter of election. This is a matter of your heart saying, Lord, I want to be used by you. And you know what? I'm weak. I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. And he's like, uh-huh. I still haven't heard anything that disqualifies you from being used. Yeah, but you don't know, God, I've got a past. I don't see your past. All I see is the blood of Jesus. Well, you know, you know, I've got this history in my family. Well, you know, when you became a Christian, you became a brand new creation. Your DNA changed. Your mind changed. You've got the mind of Christ. This is who you are now. Right? Every excuse we have, God comes back with a life answer. Every reason to disqualify ourselves, He'll give us eternal reasons why we are qualified because of Him. I, wanna, I was having lunch with a friend today, and uh, he was telling me a testimony of what happened when he was in college, and I've asked him to come share this testimony tonight. It is so simple, but so profound, and uh, this was before he became a Calvin Klein underwear model, um, but I just want him to share a little. Eric, where are you? There he is. Thank you. So I was in university in upstate New York, and at the time, I played tennis in college, and I put that at the time. I loved Jesus, but I probably loved tennis a little bit more. And so I had gone to a camp out in Colorado where we went through Philippians 3, and Paul was going, telling us, you have to count it all loss for the sake of Christ. And God came to me, and he said, all right, come back to school. I want you to quit tennis, and I want you to preach my gospel. And so how that played out was he said first to go to the football team. And here I am, five foot nothing, <laughs> probably a buck and change in weight. And he said, I want you to go to the coach and ask him if you can tell all the guys about me, about Jesus, and ask them if they'll study the Bible with you. So I went in there, coach didn't believe in Jesus, and I asked him if he would let me tell them about Jesus and if they would study the Bible with me in their weekly team meeting at the football, with the football team. He said yes. And then I went in there, 120 guys, and I told him a five-minute story about how I had believed in Jesus and what he did for us, and I said, if you would like to study the Bible with us each week, we can get together. And just raise your hand, and then I'll write down your phone number, and we'll get together. Out of that 120 guys, 50 guys raised their hand. Amen. So praise the Lord. And then out of that, in three years, in no group bigger than 10, 250 guys started to meet within three years, in our dorm rooms, just studying the Bible. Amen. So. Amen. <laughs> Tell us what happened with some of those guys that you were telling me. Sure. So 25 years later, we still get together, quite a few of us, at least 25, every year up in, in May in upstate New York. Four guys out of that are running... Uh, or ordained ministers and running congregations. And, uh, you know, we just come together every year and still support each other, pray for each other. None of us is perfect, but washed by the blood of Jesus. So. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, the beautiful thing about that story and why I wanted Eric to share it was he was available. That was it. God didn't ask him what his talents were. He didn't ask him what his abilities were. He just asked him to go and do something, and he enabled him. And what's so beautiful of the way he describes that is he wasn't uh, the attractive looking guy to the football team. You know, super huge, big muscles, everything that a football player would respect. It had nothing to do with that. It was just having the courage to say, I'm going to study the Bible. Who would do that? And so many of us thinking that we're going to go off the ramp and we're going to crash into the water before we've even done anything. Because if 
you had heard that story that a tennis player was coming to a football team to say, who wants to study the Bible with me? Nobody would have guessed that 50 guys would have raised their hand and then 200, it would have developed into 250 guys. I want you to know that God is calling you God wants to use you because you were so precious and you were so valuable that Jesus Christ hung on the cross for you. And I know we hear that so many times, but you have to remember that that truth changes our life every single day. Because as soon as you want to feel unworthy and as soon as you want to discount yourself, you have to think about the price that Jesus paid for you and your cost and value is not diminishing. Amen? Your price is fixed and it was the life of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with that life, with what is available to you, when those thoughts of condemnation want to come to you and say, nah, you're not worthy, you're not good, you're a hypocrite, you haven't grown at all. You're not changing. Look how you spoke here. Look what you did there. And you know what happens? We want to be like Adam and Eve, and we want to hide away from God. Right? I've heard that so many times. I've bumped into someone, and I was like, where you been? Well, you know, things are just, things are just really rough right now. I was like, well, that's not the time to run away. That's the time to run too. Right? You know, I stopped my Bible because, you know, I really lost it at work. And then I just felt really bad and I didn't want to. Man, that's, that's the lie of the devil. That's when we run to God because his arms are open. When my little kids hurt themselves or they smash something or they do something, their first reaction, right, is to come to dad. Is that not how it should be for us? Amen. Our healing, our restoration, our renewal, our hope is in the arms of our Father. Why are we so often trying to run away from God and trying to find something else to fill the void that only He can? Jesus Christ made you worthy. Why would you want to discount that? Turn with me to John chapter 6, please. The story of feeding the 5,000. To all the people are there, Jesus sees that they're hungry. He wants to feed them. He tells the disciple they, sh they must do it. They're like, what? They're like, even if we had all this money and all this food and all this stuff, we still couldn't feed all these people. And then comes the little boy with his lunch. Wasn't that beautiful seeing the kids praying tonight? Do you know why I believe that's happening? Because on a Sunday night, we're getting together and we are living out what we are speaking about here. We are taking the time, the opportunity to show everybody that they have the Holy Spirit inside of them and that God can use them, not just the big mouth with the microphone. Amen? Listen to this. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is this with this huge crowd? What good is it? What good is this miserable little lunch when the problem is so big? When the task is so huge, what good is this little bit of resource? And I want you to know that that thought may have crossed your mind so many times. You've looked out at the problems. You've looked out at what's going on. Maybe at work, it's a dark situation. Maybe you're surrounded by people that couldn't care less for Jesus. And you're like, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. Yeah, you are one person that's backed by an almighty God and a host of angels. Amen? What good is it, this little lunch, this little food? Let's jump down to verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. After what he did, the same with the fish. Are you ready for this? And they ate as much as they wanted. You see, what's insufficient in the world's eyes is more than enough in the kingdom of God. What's broken, what's useless, what's meant to be thrown away is recycled into priceless gems 
in the kingdom of God. You see, there was a lady who was divorced, didn't have a home, had two little kids, no tertiary education. Talk about a little lunch, right? Who dared to cry out to God and say, God, can you use me? Can you use my family? Can you make us the head and not the tail? And you know the rest of the story because that was the Phillips family. You see, that's not a celebration of how cool we are. No, no, no. It is a celebration of how amazing our Father God is because He took our brokenness and He wrapped it up in His wholeness. He took our hopelessness and He wrapped it up in hope because He is hope and things began to change and it didn't matter how broken we were because He made us a new creation. He made us whole. He made us brand new. And guess what? His mercies are new every single day. Thank God for that. Because sometimes I go to sleep going, Sherbet. And I wake up the next day going, Praise Jesus, right? Anyone else? His mercies are new every single day. He wants to use you. He wants to use you to make a difference. And here's the thing. As you give away the little bit that you have, He turns it into more than enough. When Jesus sent out the 72, the Bible does not say that they left with joy. But it does say they returned with joy. You see, because they thought they only had a little to give, but as they gave, they realized they had a whole lot to give. And as they gave, man, it started to change their life and transform their life. The widow who only had a little oil and a little flour as she gave to Elijah saw that she had a whole lot more to give than what she thought. And I want you to know it's the same for you. The world standard says, well, who are you? You're not rich. You're not famous, right? You've got all these problems. You've got all these things. But God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. In our weakness, He is made strong. And there are people here tonight that need to change the way that they are speaking about themselves because that was an old person that you are no longer that person. You are a new creation and you need to be talking like a new creation. You are a child of the Most High God and it's time you started to talk like the child of a Most High God. That list of people that I read to you, those were things that they did, but it was not who they were. You are not defined by your mistakes. You are not defined by your troubles. You are defined by your maker. And he said you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So the choice is, are you going to take that? Or are you going to say, you know what? That just sounds too good. You don't know what I've... No, no, no. It's time you laid that stuff down at the foot of the cross because he paid such a high price for that. Let me tell you what, if I saw you walking home one day and I had compassion on you, and so I went and bought you an expensive car so that you could drive around, and then a month later I saw you still walking on the street. And I was like, what happened to the car? Well, you know, it's just, I don't, you know, I don't really know how to drive, and uh, it's just, you know, I'm too dirty to sit on those nice leather seats. It's your car. Jesus has paid such a high price while we're still walking the streets when he's brought us the greatest vehicle, the Holy Spirit, to enable us, to empower us, to renew us, to restore us, to teach us. Open the door and climb in. Lord, take these words that have been spoken over me by men. And let me start hearing your words and your voice and what you have said. I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. What are you scared of? Well, I'm scared of failing. Well, apparently, he's going to keep you from falling and he's going to present you blameless and without spot or wrinkle. So guess what? You don't have to be scared. You can go for it. You can try it. Yes, you're going to get some rejections. Sure you will, but you know what you are going to get? 50 people in a football team raising their hand to say, I will study. That meant there were some people who didn't want to do it. What did it matter? There were 50 people who said yes. 
A friend of mine, we went to the football on, uh, on Sunday, and he said, you know, Brent, last week when you asked us to turn and pray for each other, man, I was like, oh, no. You know, I was, I was really uncomfortable, and, and then he said these, these words that just encouraged me so much. But then I, he said, I was like, let's do it, right? And he said, and then I began to pray with the people near me, and it was fantastic. What lovely people. I didn't even know that they were there. And now we know them and we got to pray with them. You see, you don't know what's there until you step out and try. As long as you're projecting, crashing over the bridge, it will keep you just inside your house when God wants you out. He wants you shining the light, not hiding and under a bush because he paid such a great high price. Don't let the devil diminish, decrease, and stop what he has done in your heart and in your life. Amen. If I list that out, all the mistakes that I have made, everyone here would be, you know what, I don't know if I want to even listen to this guy preach, right? If we came and just like, he has all my stuff. But you know what, like I said, it's not all my stuff. That's why I can get up and preach. Because Jesus Christ has taken that. When I said, Lord, would you take this? Would you renew? Would you restore? He's restored our family. He's restored our hearts. He's given us hope again. And then He's asked us to give that hope away. Because there is somebody out there who is feeling as hopeless as you were feeling and needs to know that there is an answer, that there is a way that with all these broken pieces, God can make them brand new again. There's somebody who's had an abortion who feels like absolute garbage that needs to know that they are still priceless to Jesus Christ and that that act does not change who they are to our Lord and Savior, that He will redeem even that very thing. Amen? There is somebody who got divorced who felt like God can't use you again because of what you've done and I want you to know that His blood is greater than divorce. Am I right? No matter what our mistakes are, somebody who was drunk driving, I've got to be on both sides of that fence, right? As you know, my cousin was killed by a drunk driver, and we also got to have a friend who was drunk driving who caused the accident. And we got to see the grace of God working in both situations, right? It's easy to think for my, my cousin's family, yes, the grace of God, the love of God, but his blood pours out on the person who did it too. And to the person who did it, I want you to know there is a hope and a future for you. There is love and grace for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we are here tonight. We didn't just come to hear a message, but we came to experience you. We came to encounter you. We came, Lord, because sometimes our hearts are heavy. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed. Sometimes we don't feel like we are children of the Most High God. But Lord, that's why we come to you, because it's not about how we feel, it's about who we truly are. Lord, solidify that image in us tonight. That we can speak with boldness and with power. Because we are seeing you at work in our own life. When we trip, when we fall, we get up again. Because we know that you are not angry with us. You are not rejecting us. Lord, but you are calling to us. Say, come to my throne. So you can receive the mercy, the grace. The amazing grace that changes everything. I'm not going to close tonight. Those that need to leave, you're welcome to leave. But we are just going to be here. We are going to be praying. We are going to be worshiping. There are some people here I know, and I ask you, that person, don't leave without letting God sink this deep into your heart tonight. There's some people that just need to pray some things away and gone and receive this gift of eternal life that God has for you. Depression doesn't need to be part of the Christian life. 
Jesus paid a price for it. Anxiety, fear, it doesn't need to be a part of the Christian life. Jesus paid a price for that. Loneliness, it does not need to be a part of the Christian life. He paid a price for that. Self-loathing, rejection, abuse, nightmares, whatever it might be, He has paid a price. And who He sets free is free indeed.